Not gonna lie, I'm pretty excited about all the things I'm gonna be able to do with a, a glyco chiller. Heading out to Atlantic Brew Supply to pick up this month's batch of ingredients. These days I batch everything up, so I put together all of my recipes for category 22. And I come down here to the homebrew store to go pick them up. So these days I just show up and Todd from Atlantic Brew Supply has got all the ingredients bagged for me, the hops, the yeast, everything. I'm good to go. They also hooked me up with a shirt as well. Pretty cool. My name's Martin Keane. I'm taking the homebrew challenge to brew 99 beers in 99 weeks. This week is a bit of a hop fest. It's double IPA. I'm brewing a two and a half gallon batch, but even then I still have a pretty big bag of grains here. So let's get these into the water. Now with a double IPA, obviously the focus on everything is with the hops, but the, the, uh, the grain or the or sort of the malt base behind all of this that we want to build is going to have a fairly light body. So we're going to mash this one low and slow. What I mean by that is I'm going to be mashing at 148 Fahrenheit or 64 Celsius uh, to really make sure that this beer properly converts without really being too heavy. The, the emphasis on this beer really is in getting that pleasant hop um, flavor and aroma profile into this beer. So yeah, one, 148 Fahrenheit. And when you are mashing at these lower temperatures, it is possible that it will take a little bit longer for the mash to convert. That said, I'm going to mash here for an hour and uh, see where I get. Now, the style guidelines for double IPA allow quite a strong beer. You can brew this beer up to 10% ABV and stay within the star guidelines. I have a lot of big beers coming up, so I'm going to scale this one pretty much right in the middle of the guidelines. So I'm building a beer here with an original gravity of 1074, which should give about an 8.6% beer. Now I'm going to be using as my base malt, two row pale malt, that will make up 85% of my grist. And then in addition to that, I'm going to add 6% of crystal 45. I do also like just a little bit of wheat in these beers. So I'm going to add 2% flaked wheat. And you might be thinking, hold on a minute, Martin, that does not add up to 100%. And you would be right. There is one other fermentable that's going in after the mash, and that is corn sugar. This is straight up yeast food, so there'll be none of this sugar left in the finished product, but it will help bump up the ABV a little bit, and this will go in with the boil. You'll often hear one of the most important things you can do as a home brewer is temperature control. If you can control the temperature that your beer is fermenting at, you really have a lot of control over what the yeast are doing and the sort of flavors and profile that you get. And for almost all of my beers, I do my temperature control in chest freezers. I have three chest freezers down here in the basement that I use with temperature controllers to set an exact temperature that I want for fermentation. And also these allow me to perform things like a cold crash as well. For the most part, I think it works really well. I 
and then producing some pretty good beer, I think. But I do always wonder how accurate this really is, especially because of the way that I've set this up. So I have a temperature probe that goes into a bottle of liquid and that gives me a reading for how cool uh, the temperature is in my chest freezer. Um, but that might not necessarily be the same temperature of my beer as the beer is fermenting and it's especially very active. It can be quite a bit warmer than the main temperature in the chest freezer. So that coupled with the fact that sometimes I will squeeze two fermenters in here and they're both at different stages of fermentation means that I'm not always sure that I'm fermenting at the temperature that I intend to. Which is why I'm so very excited to control fermentation temperature the same way that the pros do, which is to say to use glycol. And that's through this, which is the glycol chiller provided to me by Blickman Engineering. Now glycol, like the stuff in here, has a freezing point lower than the freezing point of water. The way that you use the glycol chiller is you fill up the reservoir with a mixture of glycol and distilled water, and then you will pump that through your fermenter to help keep it cool. The first thing I had to figure out though was how much glycol to add versus how much water. The Blickman manual says you need 35% of glycol to 65% of distilled water. It has an eight gallon reservoir and I had two gallons of glycol. So that left me with a little bit of a math problem. Actually, I asked around everybody in my house and we couldn't quite figure out what the exact answer is. Um, let, let me show you. So we've got two gallons of glycol and that's 35% and then we have 65% of distilled water. How much distilled water exactly is that? It's like a little bit less than four, I think. Anyway, I put in four gallons of distilled water and two gallons of glycol. As I was walking, I figured why should I take Mashing out here at 168 Fahrenheit and now let's talk about hops. This is going to be hoppy beer of course uh, so we're going to be adding hops really at pretty much every occasion so bittering flavor aroma whirlpool dry hop really trying to pack in the hop flavor that we want for this beer at every opportunity now speaking of that hop flavor well i am going for hops with a theme and my theme is down under so everything i'm using um, are hops either from australia or from New Zealand. I really enjoy those kind of new world hops, the, the, the fruitiness, the, the little bit of spiciness, the, the, uh, the sort of the tropical characteristics, um, tartness of them. I just, just really enjoy these hops. So this is the combination that I've come up with. Um, I do have my iPad here because normally I memorize what hops I've added in to tell you on camera and my goodness, there's so many this time. So. My iPad says we're going to build uh, an IBU in total of about 87 or 88, but that really doesn't tell you very much. So let's go through these hops in order. So first of all, the bittering hop. And the bittering hop that you want to use in a double IPA is clearly going to be something with high alpha acids, just so we can keep down the amount of hop material that's going to end up in this beer. So I'm using Galaxy hops as my bittering hop. I'm gonna add this in at the start of the boil. Now, 15 minutes is when I'll make my first flavor and aroma addition. This is Matika, which uh, should give, uh, the packaging describes it as zingy, citrus and herbal flavors. So that's going in with 15 minutes to go. Then with five minutes to go, I have two hops that I am combining in here. So I have Pacifica and Wakatu. <laughs> Wakatu, Wakatu, Wakatu. I think that's how you say it. And between those, we should get lime zest and orange marmalade kind of flavors and aromas. Then with the boil complete, I'm going to perform a whirlpool. So uh, the whirlpool hops, I'm gonna add a two more. I have Nelson Savin and Pacifica as my two whirlpool hops. That should give some limey notes to the beer as well. 
Um, in addition to all of that, I will be dry hopping this beer as well a couple of days uh, into fermentation, in fact, just before fermentation completes. And uh, my iPad tells me that's Galaxy and Matuka are gonna go in the dry hop. In with the five minute hop edition. And at this point, this is when I'm going to add in my sugar into the boil, just to give it time to dissolve. That goes straight in the boil, not in the hot filter. So the boil is done and it's time for the whirlpool. Now what I've cooked up here is I've hooked up my plate chiller to my pump and I'm recirculating out the bottom of the kettle here through the plate chiller and back into the kettle. Um, I do that pretty much every time, just five minutes from the end because it will sanitize the plate chiller. Um, but I'm gonna use that really as my whirlpooling capability this time. So I've cut off the heat and now I'm gonna add in my whirlpool hops. Just give them a little stir because I'm so many hops in this sleeve now. I wanna make sure that they are getting utilized. Uh, but basically I'm now going to just leave this at this temperature uh, for about 20 minutes. Now to use a glycol chiller you need some way of getting the glycol in and out of the fermenter. Um, I have only one fermenter right now that will allow me to do that and that is this small fermenter from Anvil. So this is ideal for kind of three gallon batches. And uh, what this has is it has a, a lid here with a big port in the top. And then we have here this cooling coil which we can insert into the lid. So I'm gonna connect the hose from this into my pump and that will pump glycol up into it. And then glycol will flow into the fermenter, come out the other end and then I'm gonna dump this back into the glycol reservoir. Uh, the way that I'm gonna control the flow of this pump is to use the other thing that came with the glycol chiller, which is this, which is a temperature controller. We're too proud when we say how we feel, it comes off as aggressive. Now everybody in the spot thinks we're so offensive, so now we gotta dim our light and become submissive. But Lord, I'm so tired, I'm so sick and tired of this muzzle. Why every word I speak sounds muffled. Now tell me how can I fulfill my destiny if I can't even open up my mouth and say my... So there's not a lot of configuration to get this glycol chiller running. Obviously there's a power switch. And then we can have the option here to set the temperature. So I press set and then I can set the temperature that I want to set this to. And that will chill the reservoir to that temperature. Then looking inside, there is just the glycol reservoir here itself with some chilling coils to keep this thing cool. Bit of insulation here as well. And then if I just turn this around to the back, you can see at the back here, we've got um, the power. Uh, we've got this little tray here as well, which we can use to, uh, for, for cable management and so forth. And also here is a bit of foam. And in this foam here, this is where we're going to stick some things through, some tubing through uh, to access the glycol reservoir. Now you can see here that the temperature from this thermal well here is currently showing as 81 Fahrenheit. That is as cool as I could get it. Um, with the temperature of my groundwater. So I'm gonna use the glycol chiller to get down to yeast pitching temperatures. So I'm gonna set the temperature that I want, which is 68. And you'll see the cooling light is on. So now I need to plug in my pump and we're now sending glycol into here and then it's dumping it back into the reservoir when it's done. And let's see how long it takes to chill this down to 68. While we're waiting for that, perhaps now's a good time to talk about the yeast. I am using Y yeast 1056. This is American ale yeast. Um, yeah, just a sort of a, a good performing, fairly clean yeast is what we're looking for here and something that can handle some of these higher ABVs. So I think this one's a good choice. Mm. 
Well, that took about 25 minutes to go from 81 to 68. Every now and again, I would give this a little stir just to make sure that there are no kind of cold spots and warm spots in here. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty good. When I do this same thing in a chest freezer, it typically takes me about two or three hours to drop that much of a temperature uh, change. And I just use that time to clean my equipment. So this is all clean and full of PBW now. So I'm ready to add in my yeast. Just touching this coil, it really is nice and chilly because of the glycol. And I'm gonna leave this to ferment at 68 Fahrenheit for the next few days. And I'm gonna add those two dry hops in and then I'll bump the temperature up a couple more degrees. All right, I'm set, gonna leave this be. What is going on with this beer? <laughs> you know, there's something about these glasses. <laughs> we pour them and then it's sort of... Uh, I know, but it's like... Anyway, this is Donna. Donna, welcome to the tasting. Hi, thanks S for having me. Yeah, so let's, let's see what we think about the color of this double IPA. Well, it's very bubbly. It, yeah, it's... Super bubbly. Highly carbonated, like a sort of a dark gold color. Yeah, it, honey. Honey, yes. Like a honey. That is that is a kind of a honey colour. Yeah. Very pretty beer, like with the, the very white head on top. Uh, that grows. <laughs> that keeps growing. Uh, well, if we can get through through the bubbles, let's see if we can get anything on the aroma. So I'm definitely picking up uh, quite a hoppy aroma. Um, a little bit of sweetness, I think, in the, in the aroma as well. Are you getting anything? Yeah, uh, the sweetness for sure. Uh, do you think you can uh, get to the liquid beneath? I can. Let's, I can definitely do let's that. Give it a, let's give it a taste. So I'm not re really an IPA person, um, but this is this is okay. It's not too hoppy. I don't. No, think. you've got. The, I, I think to me, there's the definitely a hot bitterness. You pick it up on quite. Yeah. It's quite bitter, right? Yeah, uh, for sure. It's definitely very bitter. It just tastes like an English bitter. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, so, so, so that's the second part I was going to say. Actually, is that there's a very like uh, a John Smith. Yeah, there's a real malt presence to the beer. Yeah. So you've got this combination of really quite bitter, which you actually wouldn't find in maybe a John Smith, but then you've got this very malty, sweet character to the beer as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's what makes a double IPA so good. I think is you, it's got a lot of body to it, a lot of malt profile, which I really like in a beer, um, but also a real hot bite to it. Oh yeah, I can get a bit of smell now. Yeah, yeah, I can smell those hops too. Yeah. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for tasting this beer. You're welcome. And cheers. And cheers.